Hello and welcome to Game Shack. Again, we're talking about some of our fondest memories when it comes to video games. Mm, these are always fun to make, even though this is our only second episode of this, but it's always fun to reminisce about all those old times that we had and some good ones, even some bad ones. Yes, indeed. <laughs> and so, without further ado, let's get into it. One day back in 1989, I was outside my house playing basketball on the hoop over our garage. My dad came out of the house and we started to play a game of Around the World. He said that after we were done, we should go to the game store to see if they had Pac-Man on the NES because he apparently liked that game. This was news to me since I've never seen my dad pick up a game controller and play a game before in my life. I said, yeah, definitely, let's check it out, thinking that Pac-Man would be his and maybe I could get him to buy me a game too. When we got to the store, sure enough they had a used Pac-Man and it was like 35 bucks though. Once I saw how reluctant he was to buy that game, I didn't even ask if I could get a game for myself because it was clear that the answer was going to be no. So we went home with our new purchase and plugged it in and played for a while. We had a fun time as he was actually pretty good at the game which made the competition entertaining for me. I still wonder how he got good when I've never seen him playing it or any game for that matter. Maybe there was an arcade close to his work that he'd go to on lunch with some co-workers or something. Or maybe he was just a natural at the game. Either way, it never occurred to me to just ask where he got his skills from. Well, we'd play the game every now and again for a few months together, which was cool, but I'd never seen him play the game by himself. By 1990, we hadn't played the game for a while, so I figured he'd had his fun and wasn't going to play anymore. This was fine because Sega had released the Genesis and I really wanted it, but of course I had no money to buy one. So I did what any kid would do at the time. I put all my Nintendo stuff in a box, including that Pac-Man, and sold it all to fund my new Sega Genesis. I was a happy dude that day. I brought the black box home and hooked it up in Glorious RF and played Altered Beast over and over. I think that was the only game I owned until I could afford Ghouls and Ghosts and Golden Axe. Anyway, wouldn't you know it, one day my dad really wanted to play Pac-Man. He was probably thinking about it all day long, hoping he'd get to the board with a peach on it. It wasn't easy for me to tell him that I'd sold Pac-Man along with my other games to buy this new system. Oh, he wasn't happy. And boy, did I catch it hot that night. If I wasn't 17 years old, I'm pretty sure I'd have been spanked and sent to bed without dinner. He went on and on about what a waste of money it was for him to buy Pac-Man only for me to sell it later on for less money than he paid for it, and how it was the only game that he'd ever liked and he wasn't able to play it anymore. Well, he eventually got over it, and to my knowledge, he's never played a video game since. Sorry, Dad. My first memory involves the Sega Dreamcast console itself. As you might be aware, each Dreamcast in North America came with an included modem which was amazing for the time. I'd actually use it to play random games online here and there. Online gaming was pretty new to consoles and I found it fascinating. Plenty of games worked online like Quake 3, Daytona USA, Alien Front, and many more. Of course, this was back in the day when dial-up was the norm and anything faster was considered a luxury. Anyway, one night a storm came in and it was really intense. There was lots of thunder and it was raining really hard and it just went on and on. During the storm, I suddenly heard the loudest thunderclap that I had ever heard in my entire life, even to this day. What happened was that lightning had struck a nearby tree, very nearby. And what the lightning also did was pretty much destroy anything connected to the phone line. It fried all of the phones in my house, my computer's motherboard, and yes, my Sega Dreamcast. Well, actually, the Dreamcast itself was fine, believe it or not. It worked great, but the modem? It bit the dust. I was easily able to replace my phones and even get my motherboard repaired because somehow it was still covered under warranty. But I did not want to buy a brand new Dreamcast just to get a working modem. And they didn't sell them separately because every Dreamcast already came with one. But come on, I had to get it replaced. What I did next was actually Dave's idea, so I blame him. I went down to my local Target and bought a brand new Sega Dreamcast. I took the new modem from that console and replaced it with my non-working one from my system. And then I returned the console to the store the very next day claiming it was a present for my nephew and he already had one. And yep, I got a full refund. And no, I don't have a nephew. So was I evil? Well, kind of. 
I just hope that the person who bought that Dreamcast didn't have any interest in playing games online. But if they did, hopefully Sega replaced it for free under warranty. Didn't matter though, because I had my working Dreamcast modem and I was content. What's kind of funny is that same year I eventually upgraded to fiber optic internet with a blazing 10 megabits per second speed and I bought the Sega Dreamcast broadband adapter. So I no longer really had much use for my modem. I continue to enjoy certain games online at better speeds. It's just too bad that not every online game supported broadband. Nowadays, I actually don't care about playing online games at all, especially since you have to pay extra for it. So sorry everyone who befriends me on whatever random console, you'll probably never see me in any of your matches. Trust me, it's nothing personal. Back when online gaming was new, it was interesting and unique. I obviously felt it was worth going out of my way to deceive Target to continue doing. But I think I'm just too introverted to really appreciate online gameplay with people I don't know these days. Checkpoint! Your time's extended! Check your position! Alright Joe, you had a WWDWD moment, right? Uh, what would Dave White do? <laughs> That's exactly what you did because if, if I recall, you uh -huh. replaced your import Dreamcast with a US Dreamcast mm -hmm. with that very same method, right? I did and you know, sneaky guy and it, it worked yes, for it a did. while and I do remember at one point I did try to return another system mm -hmm. but the Bark or the, the the barcode, yeah, yeah. It didn't match up to the box, the one on the system, and they were like, "Ah, oh, you can't. This doesn't match." I'm like, "Damn, they're getting they smarter." Called you on yeah, it. Yeah, they're getting smarter. Well, but anyways, we've got more memories. We can remember things. So, back to it. Super Mario Kart on the Super Nintendo was one of my favorite games back in the mid 1990s. Since I was still fairly poor and didn't have a lot of games, it was always in my rotation of titles I'd play over and over along with Castlevania 4 and Super Mario World among others. So yeah, I love Super Mario Kart a lot. I love the premise of characters from the Mario universe battling it out in a Grand Prix. When I had friends over, Mario Kart would be one of the games we'd always play. I had one guy who's still a friend to this day. Let's call him uh, Wario for the sake of the story. He had a Super Nintendo and asked to borrow Mario Kart and he said he'd bring it back the following weekend. I was pretty reluctant, but I agreed and let him take it home with him. The long week passed and it felt like it took forever since I was having withdrawals. I saw Wario on Friday and he brought back my game and said thanks and that was the end of it. The next day I went to play it and noticed that the cartridge had some scotch tape on it by the label on the top end. As I inspected it a bit further, I noticed that the top back of the cartridge was cracked like a piece was breaking off. I couldn't believe what I was seeing since Wario didn't mention anything when he gave the game back to me. Of course, I called him right away and asked him what he knew about it. He nonchalantly said that his brother had stepped on the cartridge when it was on the floor. He did the best he could to fix it by putting tape on it. He didn't even apologize. I asked why he didn't tell me about it right away and he said that he didn't think it was a big deal. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. One of my favorite games at the time was just marred and he figured it wasn't a big deal? Well, it was a big deal to me since I really like to have my games in good condition, especially ones that I buy brand new. The game still played fine, but aesthetically it bothered me every time I plugged it in. I hated looking at that cartridge knowing that it was forever broken. It really hurt my fragile feelings knowing that my friend could do this to my property and act like it was nothing. You know, I eventually got over it and like I said, I'm still really good friends with this guy. But damn it, I couldn't get over looking at that hideous broken cartridge. I eventually did what anyone in this situation would do and I replaced it with another copy of the game so I didn't have to look at that ugly broken shell again. And being the good friend that I am, I gave Joe that cartridge and he still has it to this day. Now he can be the one to stare at that disfigured game that I never want to see again in my life! This is Gangster Town on the Sega Master System. It's a game that requires the light phaser gun to play and it can be enjoyed by a whopping two players at the very same time. You didn't see Zapper games doing that on Nintendo. Anyway, this story involves some good ribbing from someone else on YouTube that you may be familiar with. Pat Contry, also known as Pat the NES Punk. 
A few years ago, there was a show produced by Retroware called The Video Game Years, which, as the name implies, chronicled noteworthy games and events into the years in which they happened. Pat was a producer on the show, and I was one of the video editors, along with the likes of Corey and Try from My Life in Gaming and others. In addition, Dave and I occasionally appeared on camera to discuss subjects that we felt we could contribute to, as did Pat and plenty of other YouTube personalities. So obviously the marketing was terrible. We looked at this box. You can't really see the system of the games. You see some kid's face. Right. Well, look at him. He's having a great time. That's because he's playing the Turbo Graphics 16. Yeah, rightly so. One time in 2014 or so, we were all brainstorming what should and shouldn't be discussed on the show. I happen to opine that perhaps we were taking a look at too many things that people were already familiar with and not enough things that might offer new knowledge to the viewer. Basically, I was saying that the show was far too Nintendo heavy and that we should look at other significant games on other platforms. Like Gangster Town here on the Sega Master System, as no other light gun games at home let two players play at the same time and it might be fun for people to learn about for a minute or so. Well, Pat disagreed and that was that. Or was it? No, it did not end there. So in order to make the show, people would send in raw video of themselves talking about various subjects in front of a green screen and then the editors would get to work. I really wish I still had them, but in a couple of these raw videos, Pat would give me a little bit of flack about Gangster Town. And as for me, I tried my best to sneak references to Gangster Town into the Video Game Years episodes and even GameSack episodes. Oh, but it didn't end there either. The next convention that we were both at, Pat made sure to bring a copy of Gangster Town and offer it for sale at his table. Near the end of the con, I walked up to him and pointed it out, and of course he made sure to let me know that nobody was interested in buying it, despite being priced very, very low. Well, I thought it was funny and I laughed. The thing is, though, is that I really should have bought it from him and had him autograph it. But of course, by the time that thought entered my head, I was already on the flight back to Denver. But yeah, Gangster Town is a thing between us. And I think that we should bring the Video Game Years team back together to create a half-hour episode solely on Gangster Town which is about three times longer than the game itself. Oh, Dave, I know what it's like to have a broken game, so... It is. I'm sick of having yours, so here it is. <laughs> the thing is, I don't want it, Joey, so you have to have it. Oh, oh well. <laughs> I don't really have Super Mario Kart otherwise. It's my only copy, so I'll take it. You're welcome. Thank you, actually. <laughs> but still, we, let, let's, we've got a few more memories to go, so let's finish this up. This next story involves several games, the first of which is Batman on the Game Boy. This is because I went with some friends to the Nintendo Power Fest in Denver back in 1990, and this was one of many games that was being shown there that wasn't released yet. One of the friends that went was Dave, and I remember pointing out how the stages flipped in with a similar effect as Castle of Illusion. We were both blown away that the Game Boy was even doing this super powerful effect. I played the game for a short while, and I thought it was pretty fun, though I felt that the sprites were incredibly small and simple looking, even for an early Game Boy title. Another game that we saw there that wasn't quite released yet was Mega Man 3. At the time, I still didn't have an NES of my own, but I was already a huge fan of Mega Man 2 anyway. So of course, I was eager to see what Mega Man 3 offered. It looked really cool and the music was good, but I could tell that it wasn't quite as good as the music in Mega Man 2. Overall, I liked what they let me play there, but I walked away feeling that Mega Man 2 was still the better game. And yes, I still feel that way. After the Nintendo Power Fest was over, we all went to my house. I think this was probably the first time Dave ever came over. And of course, what did we do? We played Golden Axe on my 16-bit Sega Genesis. I know I'm only showing single player gameplay, but you get the idea. I had it hooked up to a little black and white TV in my room as that's all I had. It didn't matter though, as we all still had tons of fun. In fact, I remember one of my friends remarking that you don't even notice that it's in black and white after a while because you're just too busy having fun. We of course played this game a few times and eventually beat it, and I'm sure we played other Genesis games as well. But Golden Axe is the one I remember the most. And after we were done, my mom made us all spaghetti for dinner. 
That was a good Friday, and honestly, I'm surprised I remember it so well. But when you're experiencing brand new Nintendo games and then playing Sega Genesis right after that, who wants to forget? One week in the late 1990s, I was on a camping trip with my family. We were headed to the mountains of northern central Colorado and decided to eat dinner at a tiny little town called Walden. The population is less than 1,000 and the only restaurant that was open was a small pizza place. We went in and ordered our pizza and as we were waiting I saw a single arcade cabinet on the far side wall and I had to know what game they had. It was one that I'd never heard of before called Three Wonders and it was by Capcom. It's essentially three different games wrapped into one package and you choose which one you want to play after you pop in your quarter. The three games are an action platformer called Midnight Wanderer, which I like the best, a shooter called Chariot, and a puzzle game called Don't Pull, which isn't that great. The platformer and shooter have awesome graphics and huge character sprites that look really cool. I must have put $3 into that machine playing those games over and over again. I'm not even sure if I ate any pizza that night. When we were camping, all I could think about was this game and how did it end up in this tiny town and how had I never heard of it before? Ultimately though, I was wondering if it ever had a release on a home system. When I got home from that trip, the first thing I did was hop on the internet to learn more about it. I found out that it did get a release on the PlayStation and Saturn in Japan. Oh, there was hope for me to find this game on eBay then. Every day I searched that site, but no copies ever came up for auction. I was getting really frustrated and it got to the point of me posting on forums asking if anyone had a copy that they'd want to sell. Of all places, somebody on GameFAQs had a copy for the PlayStation and was in the market to get rid of it. This person didn't want cash but wanted to trade something for it. He asked if I had any Turbo Graphics games. He said he wanted Lords of Thunder and guess what, I had a copy. This was when I first said to myself, hold on now, you're about to trade a game with somebody from a freaking forum that you've never met before. How could I possibly trust that this person wasn't going to totally screw me over and just take my game and not send his to me? But who knows, maybe this person was having the same thoughts about me. I thought it over and decided that I needed to have this game and went through with it. We exchanged addresses and the next day I sent my copy of Lords of Thunder to him. About a week went by and to my great happiness I got the package with three wonders. My faith in my fellow human beings grew that day and I was beyond happy. It was almost as fun as I remember from the little pizza place. And its only drawbacks were a long loading time, a lot of slowdown, and very shrill sound effects. It didn't matter though as I was happy. Oh, and I was able to quickly replace my copy of Lords of Thunder with a new one. At that time a little online store called TurboZone Direct had it in stock and I didn't hesitate to buy myself another copy. That transaction with the random stranger will always be in my mind as one of the strangest things I've ever done for a game. My final story is about Virtual Hydlite on the Saturn. Now you may think this story is full of laughs because Virtual Hydlite is so bad, right? Well, maybe you'll laugh, but it's actually something I feel really bad about even though it's a long time in the past and it no longer matters at all. Basically, this is a lesson in how not to treat your girlfriend. The year was 1995 and the Saturn was still new. I was itching to play every new game that came out for it so I'd rent every game that I didn't buy. One Saturday, I was out with my girlfriend at the time. It was fairly early in the day and we both had off. This was pretty rare as we both worked at the United Artists Greenwood Plaza 12 as projectionists. This was the most state-of-the-art movie theater in the Denver metro area at the time. I loved working here. This is the same theater where in a previous episode I mentioned playing Mario Kart 64 on the big screen, which you simply couldn't do at most theaters at the time. We had a video projector that I was told cost more than $100,000 that we used to do this and other things with. Well, we weren't supposed to play games on it, but we did. Anyway, there were only three projectionists for the entire building and my girlfriend and I were two of them. So getting a significant amount of time off together didn't happen a lot unless the other guy worked a double. So as we were out, we stopped at a local game store called Buyback Games in Inglewood and I rented Virtual Hydlide. It should be noted that when I rented games at this store, I only ever rented them for one evening at a cost of $1 per game per night. That's why I rented everything that I could, because it was really cheap. So after this, we eventually make our way back to my place and, well, guess what happens next? 
That's right, I go straight to my Sega Saturn and start playing me some Virtual Hydlide. I wasted literally no time because, come on, it's Virtual Hydlide. It's gotta be good. As you'd expect, my girlfriend was pretty upset that I was spending my time playing with this turd instead of spending it with her. So she just got up and went home as I was playing the game. And you know what? I didn't even really feel bad about it at the time, but I also had no idea how pissed she was. I probably only played the game for about 15 to 20 more minutes after she'd left and then never played it again until it showed up in GameSack episode 177. Games that make the console look weak. Seriously, watch that episode. I'm really happy with the way the virtual highlight segment in that one turned out. So there I was sitting by myself with nothing to do for the rest of the day and no girlfriend to hang out with. I apologized, but even to this day, I feel that was definitely a dick move on my part. I mean, what guy basically ditches his girlfriend for a chance to play one of the worst games to exist? We truly do grow wiser as we age. Actually, no, I take that back, I'm still an idiot. And since then, the old Greenwood Plaza 12 Theater has been closed down. As of the making of this video, it's been gutted and remains empty, hoping for a buyer. Oh, and look! When they took everything out of the place, they left behind the video projector that we used to play Mario Kart 64. That's how useless this thing is in today's world. The building is in very rough shape now and it'd take a lot of money to fix her back up nice and good. There's no fix for virtual hydlide though. All right, there we have it. Some more awesome gaming memories. Uh, well, for us, anyways. Yeah. <laughs> and I totally remember that Power Fest. That thing was so much fun. I had a great time and coming to your house for the first time. Now, I've got a question. Do you think that's where your love for Golden Axe started? It very possibly could have, you know? I mean, I had a great time playing on your little, tiny, little, little TV about the game. <laughs> right. <laughs> anyway, let us know some of the gaming memories that you have. I mean, we'd love to hear them. So let us know. And in the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. You want to play Gangster Town on the Sega Master System? It's two players simultaneously, and I have the rapid fire unit so we can cheat to win. I'd like to, Joe, but Pat Country the NES Punk says nobody cares about Gangster Town. Nobody, huh? Nobody. Well, nobody is pretty all inclusive, so that means I don't care about it either. I wish I knew earlier. Save me a lot of grief. Well, how about we go play some Bob Barker's Trick Shooting? Oh, okay. I mean, if the price is right. <laughs> <laughs>